looks like we're covering a massive amount of territory today. Next slide, please. Here's our format uh, for the session. Part one includes two presentations covering three topics which are really key to working on climate action in a health promotion context. And those will run for about 30 minutes in total. Part two will go for 20 minutes or so and will feature two case studies that show how a climate lens can be applied in practice. Our format today doesn't include a Q&A component with the presenters, but if you have comments or observations to make as we go along, please do put them in the chat. We often find that other participants are a font of knowledge um, and may be able to answer, and we'll certainly be looking at the information as it helps us to paint a picture of where practitioners are, are at. We'll then run a quick poll before breaking into discussion groups for about 15 minutes. Next slide, thanks. We do have an absolutely fabulous lineup of presenters today, and I'd like to thank them for being willing to give up their time to share their expertise, experience, and insight. Uh, it's my pleasure, first of all, to provide you with some background for each of them. Georgia Langmaid holds a Bachelor of Health Science Honours, majoring in Health Promotion and Sustainability from Deakin University. She's passionate about sustainability and planetary health using a health promotion lens. Georgia is the Planetary Health Project Officer at Enlive in Victoria, which is a primary care partnership and not-for-profit based in Dandenong in the southeast of Melbourne. Enliven facilitates the collaboration and partnership of its members and of broader stakeholders to improve the health and well-being of the community and reduce health inequalities between different populations across a wide range of health priority areas. Dr. Rebecca Patrick is President Chair of the Climate and Health Alliance, and she has many roles at Deakin University, where she is Director of Sustainable Health Network, co-lead of the Health, Nature, Sustainability Research Group, course director of the Masters of Health and Human Services Management, and senior lecturer in health promotion. Rebecca has considerable research expertise in health promotion and sustainability, health co-benefit intervention measurement and evaluation. She's also editor of the Health Promotion Journal of Australia. Next slide, please, Rod. So our two specialists focusing on our case studies, we have Aileen Toms, the Director of Primary Health and Innovation at Kuiurup Regional Health Service. She has a Masters in Health Promotion from Deakin and is also a registered nurse who for many years worked in the field of emergency nursing. She graduated from the Queen Margaret University College in Edinburgh, Scotland as a registered nurse and completed postgrad studies in mental health. Aileen worked as a psychiatric nurse in acute and child and adolescent psychiatry for a number of years before making her way to Australia and returning to general nursing in Melbourne. She commenced at Kuiurup Regional Health Service in 2007 in a health promotion practitioner role and subsequently held various leadership roles, including manager of early parenting unit, community health. Aileen became interested in how broader ecological factors and climate change impacts on health and well-being, and what influences socially connected livable communities. And that's resulted in a number of uh, collaboration on a number of uh, publications. Edgar Caballero is Education and Sustainability Coordinator at Banksia Gardens Community Services. Ed Edgar is based on Wurundjeri country and comes from ocean and desert country in Mexico. He has many years of experience teaching and working with multicultural youth from Mexico, the US and Australia. When he concluded a PhD in environment, environmental education, he researched action taking, acquiring strong academic and practical experience to create innovative educative experiences and opportunities for young people that will promote action. Working at Banksia Gardens, Edgar has been able to grow his experience to the next level of action, facing the challenge to adapt to the changing climate. So I think you'll see we've got some very, very experienced presenters with us today, and it's time to get started. So I'm pleased to hand over to our first presenter, Georgia Langmaid from Enliven in Victoria. If we can have those slides, please, Rod. 
Thanks, Tracy, and hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, as mentioned earlier, I am the Planetary Health Project Officer at Enliven. Um, so to begin, I guess, effective health promotion needs to evolve with our patterns of life and the world in which we live. And we've seen it evolve over time as it has to, to reflect the nature of health and well-being and the development of knowledge. And we know that the 21st century poses significant and unique health and environmental challenges. But with that comes great opportunity. Um, the exploration of the intersection between health promotion and protecting the natural environment is a relatively emerging field of research and practice. Um, as you can see in the slide, I have written a research paper focusing on ecological and cultural determinants of health using a health promotion lens. The purpose of this study was to explore the application and relevance of um, conceptual socio-ecological health models, such as the Mandala of Health, which is a widely used model in academia and practice in guiding and facilitating dialogue to address the health and environmental challenges of 21st century health promotion. So today I will be setting the scene with reference to the key find findings of this research I've done. Uh, and give a brief summary of terms such as the Anthropocene, ecological determinants of health, planetary health, and talk about the role of health promotion in addressing the planetary health issues we're facing today. Next slide, Rob. So during the past half century, the physical and natural environment have been dramatically altered at such a magnitude and speed that critical ecological boundaries have been exceeded. So the Anthropocene is a new era in which recognizes this and suggests that human activity has largely been responsible for these changes and has been the dominant influence of, on climate and the environment. So human life is expanding at such a rate that is disproportionate to other supporting ecosystems that have a fixed boundary or threshold. So these include climate change, biodiversity, ecotoxicity, ocean acidification, and resource depletion as seen in the donut model on the slide. And we rely on these ecosystems to live. Uh, ecosystem services provide us many benefits, including provisioning services. So for example, food and fresh water, regulating services. So that's disease regulation, um, climate and water purification, cultural services. So including the spiritual, educational and recreational services that it brings and then supporting services. So for example, um, soil formation and photosynthesis. So these ecosystem services are fundamental to human health and the health of all other living species. And they are being disrupted, fragmented and becoming more scarce every day. And it's the scale and rapidity of these changes that human activity are causing to our ecosystems that again, are so fundamental to our existence is what makes this era that we are in, the Anthropocene, arguably the greatest public health threat in the 21st century. And this was reiterated in the latest IPCC climate report where it was described as code red for humanity with the internationally agreed threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius getting dangerously close. So many of the changes we're making to our earth systems are becoming irreversible, posing significant risks to human health. So that leads me to planetary health. Next slide, Bob, thanks. So planetary health seeks to understand and promote the safe planetary limits in which human civilization can flourish. So in other words, how can both human health and the health of the environment thrive together? Uh, and Rebecca will touch on the links between climate and health a little bit more and practical examples of the co-health benefits of climate action will be shown in our case studies a little later. So the Lancet recognizes the improved quality of health that comes with respecting the integrity of natural systems and calls for improved understanding on planetary health. And it's thought that health promotion is quite well suited to address the com complex planetary health issues. Um, why? Well, that's because the transferable competencies and the intersectoral nature that's embedded in our work in health promotion makes it such a well-suited foundation um, to, uh, to address these complex planetary health issues. Oh, any complex health issue, including planetary health. Um, and planetary health builds on these existing mandates that guide the field of health promotion and represents a new chapter in health promotion's constant redefini redefinition within public health. So, and just on that constant redefining of health promotion, 
This was expanded to include planetary health at the 23rd uh, World Conference on Health Promotion in New Zealand uh, in 2019. So this fostered the space for health promoters around the world to come together and discuss its theme, which was promoting planetary health and sustainable development for all. Further to this, going back a few years earlier in 1986, when the foundations of health promotion was developed through the establishment of the Ottawa Charter, um, included in that was stable ecosystems and sustainable resources as prerequisites for human health. So there's clearly a reciprocal relationship between the natural environment and human health, and there is a need and place for health promotion to address the changes happening in our environment and then ultimately our health. So looking again at the prerequisites of health as identified by the Ottawa Charter, you can see there on the slide that the rest of these prerequisites or determinants listed are very are social. So very little research policy and evidence have been done focusing on these two highlighted in yellow. The primary focus of health promotion has been on the social aspect of health, which was encapsulated by the World Health Organization Commission on the Social Determinants of Health in 2008. So it has been argued that health promotion has become ecologically blind, and that is emphasizing the social determinants of health at the expense of ecological determinants. Whereas we know that the population health impacts of ecological determinants are just as large and comparable to the impact of social determinants. Thanks, Rod, next slide. So what are ecological determinants of health? They are the key elements of the natural environment, which include oxygen, water, food, um, materials, and other protective mechanisms that sustain all life. And these elements that make up the systems have been relatively stable for the past 11,000 years. However, they are becoming disrupted through population growth, rapid urbanization, economic growth and industrialization, and ultimately declining our own health. So these quotes on the slide are from my research where I interviewed health and sustainability experts across Australia, and this is their perspective of ecological and social determinants of health. So this suggests that, socio, that a socio-ecological approach to health is required, as well as further exploration into the intersection of social and ecological determinants. And you can't address one without the other. So for example, there is growing evidence of the socioeconomic disparities between those living in low income and marginalized communities and the possibility of them suffering from higher temperatures compared to those living in high income neighborhoods. Another key finding from my research was that the health, that health promotion um, has been criticized for being anthropocentric and that's, that is the perspective that views humanity at the core and center focus. Thanks, next slide. So a core principle of health promotion we know is equity. However, it, health promotion is usually within, sits within a dominant Western paradigm where indigenous knowledge systems are often being omitted from conventional public health approaches, despite them sustaining Australian ecosystems for approximately 70,000 years. So for example, facets of Western culture, such as the use of cars as our predominant mode of transport or our consumption of single use products and non-recycling or throwaway culture of society can negatively influence the natural environment and ultimately our health. However, cultural determinants from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander perspective acknowledges that strong connection to culture and land can increase a stronger sense of self-identity, self-esteem and resilience. And this is supported by the comments from participants here on the slide. So indigenous cultures can be such a valuable template for understanding culture and fostering the health of ecosystems. However, as a non-indigenous person, I was grappling with these issues and much more insight and knowledge is required in this space. So in summary, evidence suggests that the goals of 21st century health promotion should be to establish ecological equity and stable, stable ecosystems, and thereby creating a pathway for transition from public to planetary health. And to achieve, to achieve this requires an ecological analysis of the guidelines and frameworks that underpin our work in health promotion and draw our focus to the interdependence of social and ecological determinants whilst also addressing cultural determinants. Next slide. So I have developed a revised model of the Mandala of Health, which is an example of how health promotion can, 
can transition to include ecological determinants and address the planetary health issues. Um, so I chose to use the Mandala of Health model as it's widely used in health promotion. Um, and I, so I revised the original Mandala of Health to better reflect the contemporary health issues of 21st century. So here on the left hand side is the original Mandala of Health developed by Hancock and Perkins in the 80s. And on the right hand side is the model I designed in my research, which we call the revised Mandala of Health. So the key elements are the centrality of ecosystems in the middle of the model, which is in an attempt to make the transition towards ecological determinants being at the forefront of health promotion. Um, it's also three dimensional to include time and geographical scales, as we know that impacts on human health and the health of the natural environment can take place at more than one scale and across different time scales. Um, and it also acknowledges the importance of cultural determinants of health in creating a sustainable future by explicitly including Indigenous knowledge systems. So this revised model provides an opportunity for further dialogue and refinement to occur to benefit the promotion of health with due respect of the environment. Um, I believe a paradigm shift is required to better understand our intrinsic connections and relationships with the environment. It's time to expand the dialogue and include more voices and perspectives, including First Nations people, in a collaborative, respectful manner when addressing planetary health issues. If health promotion can better reflect the interrelationship between health and the natural environment, then health promotion can, can become such an indispensable tool in offering solutions for human-caused environmental damage and therefore better health outcomes for future generations to come. So over to you now, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. You've certainly set the scene uh, on the intersection between planet, climate and health promotion, and certainly giving a nod to the fact that our principles of pra and practices in health promotion set us up really well for potentially being quite effective uh, in this space. And I'd like to say hello to the 103 participants that are online. Uh, so I'm going to narrow the focus in, so coming a little bit one step down uh, from George's uh, starting point there, and I'm going to focus in on a particular facet of the connection between climate change and health, and that is climate change, nature and mental health promotion. And I'm going to talk about that in, with respect to it being a setting for co-benefits. Can I change the slide, please? Fabulous. But before I do, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, country. I'm on Kulin Nation uh, land at the moment, uh, living out in uh, Hobson's Bay uh, area. But the photo here is actually down the surf coast, a wonderful part of the world and a place I'm really looking forward to connecting to in the, in the very near future. Uh, next slide, thanks. So, before I dive into um, to the program, uh, just a little bit about me and just my connection to the group um, that's online today. I'm a Frankston gal, uh, born and bred and spent the first 25 years or so down the southeast um, of the metro area. And I started out in women's health. I worked at Women's Health in the Southeast uh, for a while and started my, my career in that space. And then I subsequently went on to work in health promotion roles uh, in community health out in the Southeast. So I'm really touched to be able to um, uh, have an opportunity to speak in this forum today. On this slide is a couple of logos and uh, of the affiliations I have and from the position I'm speaking from today. On the left hand side is the Climate and Health Alliance logo and as was prefaced in um, at the start, I'm the current president and chair of uh, the Climate and Health Alliance and I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, what we do there in a moment. And the other two logos is my affiliation with Deakin University, uh, uh, looking after a couple of groups uh, there. So in my very brief presentation, I want to give a little overview of what we're doing at the national level in the Climate and Health Alliance. So I can see from some of the participants, we've got members amongst us. And then I'm going to switch gears into focusing on some of the evidence that we've developed in our research, again, at that nexus of climate, nature and, and mental health and health promotion. And, um, and then give a nod to some of the other fantastic work that's happening across, across the nation. But importantly, I'm looking at this from two angles, and that is the negative mental health impacts 
of climate change and environmental degradation and all the other things that Georgia pointed out. But I'm also looking at the uh, what I call hoping and coping part of the equation, and that's the well-being aspects of connecting with nature and nature as a setting for health promotion. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so briefly, the Climate and Health Alliance. If you don't know us, this is who we are. Uh, outlined here is who we are, what we do, and who our partners are. Uh, our core business is to mobilise the health sector for action on climate change. And our alliance, as depicted by just a few of the organisational logos here, uh, is made up of more than 80 health organisations, peak associations, research groups, uh, and also community and women's health services, plus individual members. We have a Friends of CAHA group. We also bring the health voice to the climate um, uh, Kana. And internationally, we're a partner uh, on various form, forums, including Healthcare Without Harm, and also we look after the Global Green and uh, Healthy Hospitals Network for the Pacific region. Um, we're a lead of a Our Climate, Our Health campaign, which has been calling on the federal government to develop a national strategy on climate change, health and wellbeing. Take me to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I suppose our theory of change or what sits behind this, and I think this is also what sits behind the work that um, all of us are doing in this space, is we know that the health voice is afforded status and credibility in the Australian community, and that health is a very effective frame for communicating uh, climate change as an issue. So health voices talking about climate change helps make that connection and it elevates the issues. Next slide, please. Here is a gorgeous and wonderful group of people that have been involved uh, in our, our climate, our health campaign, health professionals that are taking climate action and calling uh, for policy and doing the work of advocates and, and education in the, in the broader community. So this is the campaign that sits around our policy and advocacy work at CAHA. I can't go into all of our programs and activities, but I just want to highlight one or two more, if you could change the slide, please. Here's our roadmap for a federal climate and health policy. This framework uh, was first presented to Parliament in 2017. It's currently out for consultation as we develop our 2.0. Admittedly, the evidence and the engagement is building, so we've needed to, to refresh uh, this platform. But what's outlined uh, and on the slide and within the framework is to guide government policy and decision making. So support policy responses to help Australians mitigate and adapt and minimize, minimize threats of health from climate change to meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement and also to demonstrate our success against the Lancet Countdown, which is due for lease very shortly. In our 2.0, uh, we emphasise the mental health issues related to climate change across all areas of the framework. Next slide, please. Just quickly, uh, there's the new framework, uh, eight dimensions on the left-hand side. And again, mental health is featured across that. And a nod to some of the work that we're doing in terms of education and engagement. I, only last night with the benefit of Georgia's engagement as well, we ran a expert panel on climate change and mental health. And I can see some of you, including the wonderful Sue Rosenhan in the audience there, uh, was along the ride for last night as well. So that's Climate and Health Alliance in a nutshell. And that's what's happening at the national level. And I feel very honoured to be able to look after that organisation uh, with my colleagues at this point in time. Tracy, how am I going for time? Do I need to speed up, slow down? We've got about eight minutes to go, Rebecca, in total. So you're doing well. Okay, fabulous. Okay, now switching gears and bringing another layer down, and that's to, to the research that we've been doing uh, at Deakin University with our partners uh, and particularly with emerging leaders. So PhDs, honours and master's students make up a big membership. And you can see George's work is uh, in the mix on this slide. So these are the gorgeous people that I get to work with every day who are like-minded in caring about planet and health as one package. And this, uh, this slide just gives you a, a little bit of a snapshot of some of the research that we're doing in this space. 
Now, the next slide, sorry, I was talking about something and you weren't looking at it. It's the next slide now, thank you. Okay, here are some of the key concepts or givens that our research group uh, or scientists in this field are working from. And Georgia has uh, beautifully set out what planetary health is. Another aspect of planetary health is, is the, the idea of the biophilia hypothesis. That means that we are hardwired both physically and psychologically uh, to, to seek contact with nature. So I call it being hardwired to be in contact with green rather than concrete. So we're deeply ingrained to have that nature connection. We know that climate change and environmental degradation are public health and health promotion issues and Georgia set that out for us. But we also know that we're experiencing loss of nature through urbanization technology. Uh, and, and we call this environmental deprivation. But I suppose the antidote to that uh, is, is um, providing uh, people with the opportunity to connect with nature and climate and environmental action both helps the environment and also helps reduce um, the, the, the worry about climate change, but also can be health promoting. And I'll go into that in a, in a moment. And I want to in bold type here, has, as I've done on the slide, is that nature is a setting for health promotion. Next slide, please. Just very quickly, I think um, the link between mental health and the natural world has certainly come to the fore uh, in 2020 and 2021. Georgia Harmon, the CEO of Beyond Blue, says the challenges of these times, uh, most notably the bushfires and COVID-19, has taken mental health issues from simmer to boil. Uh, we've had the devastating bushfires demonstrating that um, uh, climate change is real urgent and now. It's not somewhere down the track, it's right now. Um, and of course, who can forget the wonderful fin burns uh, steering away from the apocalyptic uh, backdrop that which was the bushfires. And of course, there's other uh, icons of the last uh, two years being fossil fuels as we encourage the government to uh, stop investing and also the, uh, the uh, image of the mask, which both protects us from air pollution uh, and also COVID-19. Next slide, please. So in the last two years in the media, we've heard a lot of these teams, uh, terms, not teams, terms, uh, and in anxiety, eco-anger, depression, climate grief, climate trauma. And the way that we think about uh, the psychological responses to, to climate change is that it's a reasonable response uh, to the loss of connection or worry about the future of the natural environment when we're faced uh, with the impacts of climate change on, on um, the environment and also society. So you would be familiar with these terms, um, you know, the different manifestation of a broad overarching response to um, concerns about climate change. Let's keep going. Thank you. And so the impacts of climate change on mental health quite simply can be experienced before in an anticipatory type way about worrying about the future and climate change during a climate event, uh, while you're exposed to an, an event or after where we know with the social determinants being a mediator that there may be cultural displacement or post-traumatic stress. Next slide. And not to the research we've done at a national level uh, where we partnered with Monash University and ABC Science Week to really get underneath uh, uh, the mental health impacts of climate change and also how people are, what strategies um, people are using to cope with climate change in Australia. We're really fortunate that we got a representative sample or very close to, meaning that we were able to uh, survey across different socio-economic demographics, rural, regional, urban and different parts of Australia. So the data has told us on the next slide that 55% of the Australians believe, uh, subscribe to having a direct experience of climate change. And this is significant or it really matters 
because individuals that have a direct experience are more likely to be concerned about the issue, more certain that it's driven by global heating. And notice I say heating, not warming, because warming sounds nice, heating sounds a bit tougher. And they're more inclined to take sister un, uh, to to undertake sustainable behaviours. We also find that they were more worried about climate change than COVID-19, even when they were deeply um, let, locked down. We also found that amongst our 18 to 24 year olds and 25 to 34 year olds, there was high levels of eco-anxiety running at somewhere between 20 and 24% of our sample. We also found with people that have a direct experience of climate change, high levels of PTSD symptoms. I'm not saying they had PTSD, but the way that we measured it, there were symptoms there. On the flip side, on coping, uh, people in the community aren't necessarily seeking traditional mental health care, rather they're doing self-prescription. They're getting out in nature, they're getting knowledgeable about solutions and they're changing their own lifestyles. Let's keep moving, next slide. Importantly, here's the voices of people that participated in this research, and you won't be able to read through them all, but there's one, the first quote is about the experience of distress. The second quote is about anger at those people in power. The third one is about that avoidance, or it's really not a problem. And then the fourth one is some of the denialism that kind of came through in our survey. We do find with climate change and climate change and health surveys that we do generally pick up um, the denialists as well. They've often got a lot to say. Next slide, please. Rebecca, I'm going to stay two minutes from there. Okay, please. all right, I'll speed up. Young people. Uh, we did some work uh, alongside young people and we've established that they're a priority population along with some of the other groups identified on this slide. Um, and in Victoria, 50% of young people in a sustainability Victoria uh, survey, uh, there was over 50% were saying they're feeling sadness, anger and fear about climate change. On the flip side though, where there's those protective factors already in place, young people are faring better. Here's a slide that describes the determinants. Sorry, thank you, keep, keep going with me. Next slide. Are the determinants. So you have climate change and mental health impacts, but something mediates it. And so social media, contact with nature, um, uh, education mediates the outcome. Next slide. Here's the voice of uh, a climate hero, we call them, and it's about feeling empowered to know that you're gonna be a part of a generation that hopefully brings about positive change. So importantly, young people's in, uh, voices should in, uh, inform the way that we work. Now to the co-benefit story, and Tracy, I know that you're looking at me very closely now, so I'll make sure I'll stay to time. No, just, we've, we've got some time up our sleeves, so you don't need to belt along. Take a right. and away we go. All right. The piece de resistance to the storyline here is around co-benefits. We've done some research on different uh, intervention spaces, including the co-benefits of environmental volunteering or conservation activity. And this little bit difficult to see slide here um, is shows the different co-benefits of participating in environmental volunteering or conservation. We can see there's mental and emotional outcomes, social inclusion, individual skill development, spiritual health outcomes, and then the physical health outcomes. But at the same time, there's those environmental outcomes. So as a health promoter, this may mean there's opportunities to design interventions in health promotion that are around in volunteering into environmental initiatives. And I think one of our case studies goes to that a little bit later on. Next slide. A little bit more um, around childhood contact with nature. We know that higher contact when we're young uh, lowers neuroticism in adulthood. Uh, I like more of that. Um, Nature-based activities um, that people with mental illness, uh, when they participate in nature-based and outdoor activities, we can see improved mental health self and self-management of illnesses. We've also got Green's prescriptions as another opportunity for our work. I could spend a, a whole 20 minutes on that, but I won't. And then we're gonna talk about Kuriwap Regional Health Services work. One more slide, thank you, no, two more slides. 
So that's that's the uh, broad array of research. So it's very compelling evidence about this nexus that if you take action on climate and environment, there's co-benefits for your well-being and your health, and there's also co-benefits for the natural environment. And that, I suppose, it goes to the heart of what we're doing in municipal public health and well-being plans when we have regard for climate change. A nod to two important organisations that you might put in, in your, um, your phone book or your log, Psychology for a Safe Climate, they're running workshops for practitioners about their response to climate change because it can be hard graft when you work in this space. And then the next slide uh, is a group called People and Parks Foundation and they're leading some magnificent interventions around nature scripts. So look them up if you're seeking inspiration for developing nature-based health promotion interventions. I'm done. Thanks for listening. I hope uh, you found, found yourself in, in my presentation. But I won't stop there because I want to hand to the next person, don't I, Tracy? Okay, so keep going, um, Mr. Slides. That's me. If you want to contact me, please do. Keep going. Thank you. Wonderfully, we have Aileen Toms, uh, someone I have worked with uh, over time for oof, more than 10 years, who's going to talk about a climate lens on health promotion. Over to you, Aileen. Lovely. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, yes, I have been very fortunate um, in my um, health promotion career to, and academic career to be able to spend a bit of time with Rebecca and also with Georgia, which has been wonderful, and the team at Enliven. So um, it's, it's been terrific to be invited here today. And I thank everybody for coming along and listening to what we've got to say. Um, so the, the previous speakers have talked really a lot about the different research. So this is a very practical example um, of, of the um, work that we've been doing at Help in uh, Kui Rap. So if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, so Kui Rap itself was established on uh, marshland and it's at the head of Western Port Bay. Um, which is located in the southern part of Kadunisha in Victoria, about 75 kilometres from Melbourne. So prior to the European settlements of the area, which was occupied by the Bunarong people, it's from their language that the town uh, derived its name. So Kui Rap is allegedly meaning blackfish or blackfish swimming, plenty of blackfish. And a lot of the... Um, uh, clinics, shops, news, local newsletter reflect that name. The Kubi Rap is a rapidly changing community and it's increasingly um, a residential centre in a rural district that's famous for its asparagus production, market gardens, dairying. Kadunisha is also one of the fastest growing LGAs and we are experiencing that urban creep, the reduction of farmland and social issues that many country towns face, as well as those impacts of the changing climate. Kadunisha itself is a place that's very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and the health service has been involved in providing not only immediate responses to more frequent extreme weather events in regards to heat waves, bushfire, flood, water security, but also longer term issues of food security and understanding the mental health impacts of them of those events. Uh, and so as uh, Rebecca mentioned about the bushfires in the Bunyip State Forest and the extreme bushfires that we experienced over Christmas and New Year in 2019, where that thick smoke billowed over the region causing a lot of health issues, we were able to, to activate resources. So these are all examples of um, shocks and stresses that can challenge our health system. Next, next slide, please. So Kubin uh, Hospital is a 72 bed small rural public hospital and it has a really long history of community engagement since 1923. So multiple health promotion and local uh, sustainability priorities we found can be addressed using that socio-ecological frame to understand the relationship between human health and the environments in which we live, learn, work and play. And this has enabled us to take that holistic view to understand and try and address some of the current and future health needs of our community. 
not just simply providing clinical or curative services. And within this uh, framework, health promotion practitioners have a really important role to play in being able to apply this approach to health and actively promote that sustainability within the community level practice. So through a range of like short term and longer term initiatives, we've been able to, to develop some innovation, collaboration and to build social capital and build strong networks. Um, our organisational commitment to environmental issues was systematised using health promotion resources. And over a number of years, we've been able to also use those supports, as Rebecca mentioned, about the Climate and Health Alliance. We've also participated in Resource Smart Healthcare, Take Two Sustainability Victoria, and all of these things, the, the work that Enliven's done, we've gradually been able to gain confidence to be able to apply a sustainability lens to all our health promotion initiatives. And in that way, our health promotion practitioners and our health promotion funded staff have been really central in developing up some of the actions on climate change and being able to look at how we can address uh, the, the issues. But we are also very fortunate, Kirira, that the natural environment surrounding the hospital and within the, the, the footprint, um, those key environmental determinants are there to enable our patients and our community to achieve those positive life satisfaction and health goals. Um, so really we've looked at our health promotion practice uh, orientated across the three areas being in that we can mitigate health impacts by reducing our own environmental footprint, looking at our infrastructure and our operational processes. We've also participated in a lot of advocacy work for emissions reduction, the use of urban green space, which um, as Rebecca has spoken to, uh, we know that that is very intrinsically linked to improving human health and well-being. Um, the other work that we've focused on has been around supporting and building of social capital within the community. So increasing that collective knowledge, climate literacy, and um, helping our workforce to understand how their actions can impact on this in this space. We try to use a lot of uh, programs where we can increase opportunities for health promotion interventions to protect and increase uh, connection and involvement in the natural environment through the use of uh, practical things in using that green and blue space around. Um, and we, we wouldn't have been able to do it without our strong leadership and that's enabled us to integrate these uh, climate readiness and environmental actions into our strategic planning. So next step please. But I think what we'll say is the small steps have helped us to build confidence that we know we're on the right path. We're also, um, within the health promotion work, we connect that to the Cardinia Livability Plan. And that helps us to identify and support opportunities where we can develop those practical solutions to protect and promote the ecological determinants in this changing environment. Next slide, please. So what the, this slide really talks a high overview of a lot of the very quick projects that we can take and some of the initiatives that have gone over a number of years. But enabling those environments supportive for good health has definitely been key. Um, we develop and adapt our health promotion practice to sort of um, also focus on mental health, physical activity and healthy food. We came to the space through understanding about regional food security issues around the lack of fresh food availability, despite this being a rural area and the affordability that was a, uh, for our community. And that led us to establish the vibrant community garden men's shed and eco hub that we have. And this came about through multiple stakeholders and strong partnerships from our local schools, local government, faith groups, local businesses, they all helped to provide that platform for the garden and the eco house evolution. And that contributed to the development of many mutual benefits within this setting. So the health promotion initiatives which engage community members right across the life course from early years to older adults have been, for example, with a parents and toddlers play group, nature play activity in the garden, a gardening programme for fathers and their children, 
and um, we've had paddock to play activities where we you know use the garden to grow the food and then to take it into community kitchen or various community kitchen community uh, cooking activities such as our Kardini cooks that's happened over um, the whole of the last um, 12 months um, regular community market used to happen pre-COVID where we would also have access to local fresh produce seedlings plant sales the garden works on a pick and pay system which is how people can have access to healthy produce they just drop pick their own produce and can pop a donation we have a little shop on side with gardens and pickles and preserves so all of this space is very thriving within the men shed ethos of recycling and repair program and the sensory gardens for the residential uh, care clients in the uh, aged care se services. Also held workshops with local government, um, which has helped to increase knowledge and build climate literacy, developing skills on energy, water waste, how to respond in heat waves or in storms. Um, so there's lots of different activities that we engage with our community and frequently the people who we uh, connect with are from hard to reach groups. So people who are low, from a low socioeconomic environment, socially isolated, they live in public housing, they may not have their own garden particularly, or people who have large gardens but really looking for that social connection. They might have chronic illness or mental health issues. And in this way, we've been able to, to draw, draw them together and to help us to, in, the outcomes we've seen have been improved social connection, mental, physical improvements in their own health and addressing some of that social vulnerability, climate change through that grassroots contact. On a wider scale, we've participated in the Cadenia Food Circles and that aims to create a healthy, delicious, fair and sustainable food system. So the long-term objectives of the project has been to increase consumption of fruit and vegetables and increase food and health literacy and to help reduce the obesity in this area, as well as to increase local food and farming employment opportunities. But the shorter term uh, objectives that we've been working on collaboratively with this group has been around increasing knowledge, increasing community capacity to advocate for and protect the land that this food is grown, to protect green space and to look at how our local food economy can be enabled to uh, support the community to access that produce but also the local businesses to deliver it. Uh, next slide please. Two minutes, thanks Eileen. How long? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. That's fine. Uh, so just uh, with this slide, as the speakers before us discuss, before me discussed about how the different kinds of natural setting might influence different kinds of outcomes, like those physical or mental or spiritual health that spending time in nature can promote. We've tried to use those environments that we have around us to help people to not only re reduce their emissions, but to remain physically active and be healthy. So those mutual benefits of designing a health promotion initiative that takes off those things where we can advocate for design and implementation of walking paths and bike paths around the area, uh, the wetlands that, we keep, that, are, that we're having in our um, new, new residential areas, we were able to um, bring in some bike racks in the public space, so encourage people and advocate socially um, market the right to work days. They're all things that can help us to have those core cool benefits. Our youth team work with the local government on the stop drop zones, encouraging families to walk to school safely, but again, to reduce emissions from the traffic that comes around schools. Um, we've got activity games stenciled in the park and in the community gardens. So our youth team work, um, work and help to uh, produce those. We also have environmental activities, as Rebecca mentioned, to uh, establish and maintain wildlife corridor and to do tree planting, but also to help reduce people's uh, mental uh, stress. And the nature-based therapies in, for the residents and the clients are there for within the, the facility. And that's been a very important part of the work we do. So this slide, next slide, please. 
um, sorry, is just a little showcase of the Ready to Go programme. That was an initiative that we undertook with ECHO Community and Family Services. And it was initially in, um, developed in Cockatoo in 2013. And it's a, an example of sort of quite a unique small scale resilience programme. And it connects vulnerable residents to community volunteers. And in that way, builds a support network for vulnerable people. It provides regular contact information about their health and well-being and how to manage it on those high heat days and then through other extreme weather events. But um, one of the key things of this project was that we know that um, health services are very trusted and the volunteers that we engage with are trusted individuals. So the building of social connection with the residents and establishing those relationships which build trust assist the people to have those practical strategies to protect themselves in severe weather conditions. And they help to uh, support the individuals with their emergency plans and can relocate them. Last slide, thank you. Uh, so I would say that um, just to summarise, health promotion practitioners really have an important role to play in applying those ecosystem approaches to health and to actively support and promote sustainability within their community level practice. I agree that with Georgia that that paradigm shift really enables a more holistic view that can include into thinking about how we can incorporate natural settings to help mitigate the increasing pressures of modern living on people's cognitive and emotional health, but also how we can engage levels of physical activity and access to healthy food. Um, so they are all the things that can help communities to adapt in a really positive and healthy way to the changes that we're experiencing. So thank you. Hopefully I managed to get through that last little bit and I will be delighted to hand over now to Edgar to um, talk about his, his programme. Thanks, Edgar. Thank you, Arlene. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to present here, George and Heather and Liv and team. And thank you everyone who um, are giving us your, your time and space to listen. I migrated to live and then I am in wooden jetty, Woi Wurung land, and I am constantly learning about country. Therefore, I acknowledge I respect country, which is the land, the waterways, the sea, the sky, the living soil, the animals, the plants, the wind and fire. Country I respect is also family, identity, spirit, language, customs, law, knowledge, nourishment, stories and connection. Respect elders past, present, and emerging who are custodians of a traditional knowledge which has been passed orally for many years, and I'm grateful to be able to learn it. And so my intention to manifest, my intention is to manifest my respect to country through the work we do, and I will be showing to you, as it has no other intention, but to care for country. Um, it is action towards the risk we are facing in this land, as is the land where I come from. And I also want to acknowledge that this program is uh, in the middle of um, where young people are rightfully demanding action and change. And that's what I want to talk to you, tell you about this program. Next, next please, um, if I may. Uh, we are... Banksy, well, I represent now um, Banksy Gardens, which is in Broad Meadows, you might be familiar. We're a 40 year old organization and one of the most diverse and disadvantaged communities in the Northwest. Next, please. We have a lot of programs running, a lot of coordinations, even if we're a small organization, community organizations, and uh, we focus on social justice advocacy and we give voice to those in our community who suffer injustice and we believe we transform lives. It has not been until recently where we have been able to focus ag again because we started being uh, had a strong environmental crisis focus, but after going through and responding to our community's needs, which has been 
develop and needing to respond to deep and old traumas. Now we're also now we also have the capacity to focus on this, which you might recognize that is not disconnected. Next, please. So um, the climate adaptation requires youth action is this program that I want to introduce to you, Caria, and it, it comes, it came from this idea that it, it's also a seed that it will grow. And see, that's the meaning of the word Caria, which is also part of the binomial name, scientific name of the walnut that you see there. And um, it, this idea has, um, has been possible thanks to the belief of the department that dealt the environment, land, water, and planning last year who gave us a, a grant to implement this program and this year for the second year we're implementing it again thanks to the big support and belief from the lord mayor charitable foundation so we appreciate that so next please it's a journey carrier is a journey and it starts when people express their interest and it starts from there because what the first thing that we ask for them is to submit a creative element. We believe that the, the effort of put some creativity on the environmental topic is as important as we have heard constantly on, on our previous uh, presenters. So I'm very happy that that it's supportive. Uh, this is an action supporting all, all the theory that we understand so it's a 10-week training program uh, and after the training program it's a youth-led community initiative currently right now we have our first generation and we meet every fortnight and actually like an hour ago i had uh, probably our last interview with um the new with with the last person with the new cohort that we are starting next week Next, please. Last year, I'll show you from where did we receive the interest. It was particularly or specifically directed to Hume City Council boundaries because that's where we we're located, but not necessarily. Well, with the pandemic and the enclosure, it changed completely our approach to things because um, my background and all that I have learned is to create um, educative experiences that are meaningful in order to change, in order to take action. With the need of taking it to an online situation, we actually expand. And so all these places that you see um, uh, submitted in, in interest, even a student in, from Melbourne University in Vietnam, who still is not uh, has not been able to come to Australia, but studying in Melbourne Uni, and she's one of the most active participants in our in our program next please um so we ex we designed carrier to explore a number of relevant topics we invited a number of experts on each of the topics we also participated in in in, in giving some of these insights in in these topics but the main purpose of the training is to learn to take action by taking action so we used an action competence approach and a framework, which is what I, what I did during my PhD. And we decided to have rich experiences in place, in places where, where people are already doing things, could show us their experiences in climate adaptation and, the, and mitigation, of course, particularly has the focus on climate adaptation because, well, it's needed and the department that dealt uh, grant that we got uh, to start this, to launch this program um, was focused on, on that. So definitely we need to, to incorporate both <laughs> equally important elements of the climate emergency, adaptation and mitigation. Next, please. One of the powers I should say of CARIA it, that is that it was designed with young people for young people. So this, this is the, a group of young engineer students from Massachusetts who um, engaged with us to design this program. So we created a, even a manual, which by the way, it's, it is available. It's, it's an open source available for, for this uh, career program to be replicated uh, and adapted as, as needed. Um, and part also part of the design is to ask the participants about their interest in the different topics of the training. 
if, if you can give a click for for the next to show here yeah, thank you um i just wanted to point out for the relevance of this of the audience who, who are here that the health impact has been highly expressed to be an important element um can we go to the next to the next one so i can actually show you um the interest on healthy impacts of climate change from last year and, and this year so career participants have expressed a high interest uh, in this in this topic right so next one please and so this is the these are the workshops we we meet online and um but we understand that um well the challenge was how do we transform an engaging excursion experience over Zoom, over what we're experiencing right now, it's hard to make it engaging, fun, and, and interactive. So we need to establish good relationships with each other before being able to act. So what you're looking at is um, uh, one day we, uh, we have a candle, so we share time and experience, we acknowledge country, and each person has an opportunity to do so. We have a spiritual link with this candle, uh, communal agreements, uh, breakout rooms to socialize and games. Next one, please. Everything that we do, this is a candle and the meaning we give. So we give meaning to our actions. It's also part of um, developing this integration of a group. Because without the group, without our social connections, you might understand that we we're not able to, well, one, be creative and... Um, and and create do actions next one please two minutes thanks edgar thank you very much um well this was the graduation when for the first time we were in person meeting even with and and uh, from from vietnam still remotely um joining us and we were able to go to the excursions finally so next please i'm going to scroll quickly just to show you what were we doing uh, we went to a bush Tucker walk at West Meadows with um, Auntie Jo. Next one, please. We went to Nangak Tambury Latrobe Wildlife Sanctuary, which is, uh, we, were, you know, we were invited. It was a, a great experience. We were able to simply, you know, go and test the health of that pond where Dunia is um, um, doing scouting for some micro biota over there. Um, next one, please. We went to the beach with Conservation Volunteers Australia to learn about microplastics and, uh, well, the plastic pollution in, in the ocean. Next one, please. We organized this excursion, uh, an electric bike ride from Broad Meadows to Brunswick, which will cover topics of transport and with our friends at Jesuit Social Services at the Eco Justice Hub. I don't know if you're familiar. Next one, please. They have this fantastic place, which is basically a car park, and they transform it with a permaculture approach to um, community garden. We also learn about a zero waste cooking. Next one, please. And we are still to do one more permaculture uh, visit to the plumber with Kat Levis, a fantastic person of this um, of the movement. Um, and lockdown after lockdown we're still waiting to have the opportunity to go next one please now time for action our participants have uh, these three big elements community garden and communal composting uh, which is part of the revitalization project the, um, that we have education and community outreach and social media campaign and we're uh, hoping to screen the 2040 the movie the participants are particularly for secondary uh, local secondary school next one please um am i um well i think how are we in minutes just to show the extra element yeah if you you've got a couple of minutes okay. I'll, I'll do oh. this very quick because okay. what, what we are providing is also a project where our participants and obviously the, our neighborhood can join and to create. So if you can click at the next one, I'm going to show you where the center is located and the space around it. Next one, please. This are, I just want you to show you, and next one, the looks of this space. 
available space. This is a grassland reserve that we have, uh, that, we, that we are carers for it. But also in this space, you know, these are fires, young people, you know, engage with um, illicit activities, uh, many, um, and next one, please. We, we have heard of a, a motorcycle also being burned around, around the space. Um, but next to the center, which is what you're looking at, we already have a few um, trees and plants and community spaces. Where, where we can go. Next one, please. This is a space that we want to create as a heat haven. That is a refuge for the heat waves that we're going to experience and a place, and we want to create it as a food forest. So next one, please. A place that produces, a place that gives canopy and space to refresh during the heat waves, uh, a place where it's rich in diversity, um, I want to point out that our very good friends of DPV Health share some of that space and, and you know, like we, we see how much influence this would be for all the patients and people who visit this, this uh, space and the local residents. Next one, please. And to point out that it's located next to the very big broad matter shopping center, which what the picture that you see it's it's two times larger than that understanding that's the refuge heat refuge that people seek for the um climate i mean for the um, air conditioning they provide but also understanding as a system they produce more heat so that's the transformation we are going through and that is the opportunities and experience that we're giving to the young people so again thank you for the opportunity and uh, over back to you, Tracy. Thanks so much, Edgar, and of course to Georgia, Rebecca, and Aileen as well. Very, very inspiring. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about, lots of motivation to act, and whether that's starting on this as a new topic for you and your organisation, or, or perhaps building further on existing work. Um, so now you can see it's time for a really quick poll. This is an important part of our session. So not only does it help us to evaluate this workshop, but your feedback will point us to next steps. For example, is that more capacity building or advocacy action or partnership activity? And we'll also look to share that information with others um, who have a role in supporting the prevention sector. So we're gonna give you five minutes to complete the poll. Yeah, just quickly, a couple of things uh, a few things that are, have been in the news just this week um, that we'd like to draw your attention to. Um, forum last night on the 6th, which was the mental health discussion, I think um, Rebecca may have referred to that. So keep an eye on the Kaha website. That should be a web website that goes um, at the top of your bookmark. Um, launch of Together We Can on the 5th, so on the Tuesday, um, which was Kaha in partnership with Together We Can Australia. And that's a really fabulous community-based sort of campaign that started some key social media um, links there. This week is actually the Community Sector Climate Change Advocacy Week, um, led by ACOS. And you might have seen some, some materials and news reports on ABC last night, which was fab fabulous to see it making into um, national mainstream media. And lastly, uh, just recently, the big branch of the Australian Health Promotion Association in their recent news bulletin mentioned a save the date for a seminar on the 25th, which is climate change challenges and opportunities. So there's a heap happening out there, um, which it's hard to keep on track of, but if you can sign up to some of these key um, websites and organisations, become members, there's just a way of getting a, a lot more of that information filtering through, which will really inform our work. So that's the close from us. We've made it to 1.30. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it and you can use the information and ideas presented to help you in your work. Thank you again for your attendance and also to, of course, our fabulous guest speakers. We'll be sending out a link to the recording and all the slide deck in the coming weeks. So from us, it's good afternoon to... Um, to everyone. Bye for now.